Hey, what is up you guys and welcome back to my channel and welcome to another unsolved mystery video. Today's video is going to be about a case that I thought I knew absolutely everything about until I actually sat down to do my in-depth research for this video. There are so many layers to this case, it's honestly kind of difficult to sift through everything, but that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. So let's go ahead and just jump right in. In the United States alone, it's reported that on average, about 90,000 people are missing at any given time. While many of them end up being found, whether that be dead or alive, many others remain missing to this day. And that's where we stand with this case. So today I'm gonna to be telling you about the mysterious disappearance of Maura Murray. Maura Murray was born May 4th, 1982 in Hanson, Massachusetts to her parents, Fred and Lori Murray. She had two older sisters, Kathleen and Julie, one older brother, Fred Jr., and one younger brother, Kurt. She was raised in an Irish Catholic family, and her sister Kathleen would go on to say that they all had a pretty great childhood, although when Maura was just six years old, her parents would divorce, after which Maura lived primarily with her mother, but Maura maintained a solid relationship with both of them. Maura attended Whitman Hanson Regional High School, where she was a star athlete on the school's track team alongside her sister Julie and a straight-A student. Her father, Fred, would coach the girls and push them to do their best. But when a kid really loves a sport, they don't need to be pushed too hard, and that's kind of how it was with Maura and Julie. They loved track, and it almost came naturally for them. When Maura graduated high school, she was accepted at West Point Military Academy in New York. Her sister, Julie, was actually already attending this school studying to be a nurse. Maura studied chemical engineering at West Point for three semesters before abruptly leaving and enrolling at the University of Massachusetts Amherst to study nursing. So why did Maura leave West Point so abruptly when it seems as if she had worked so hard throughout high school to set herself up for her future? Her cadet records at West Point show some behavioral problems that seems pretty inconsistent to the kind of girl that she grew up portraying. She had overall been a good girl with nothing in her past to suggest that she was anything besides what people around her saw. So what happened that caused her to deviate so far from her decided path? During her time at West Point in August of 2001, Maura was caught stealing about $5 worth of makeup from the commissary at Fort Knox, which resulted in an honor code violation. An investigative hearing was held to determine what kind of punishment would fit her stealing this makeup. Allegedly, Maura pled guilty and it was recommended that she be removed from West Point. However, before the school was able to make their final decision, which was set to be made at the end of January of 2002, Maura withdrew herself from West Point on January 2nd, 2002. It's also noted that during the year of 2001, Maura was put in front of the disciplinary committee seven times. So what caused Maura to do a complete 180 from the kind of person she was in high school? Was she just trying to adjust to the freedom that college life gave her? Or was the good girl persona just an act? Or even worse, had she done things like this prior and just didn't get caught? After leaving West Point, Maura was accepted into the nursing program at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and it's said that she was doing extremely well. She also began working on campus as security as well as at an art gallery. She was dating a guy that she met at West Point in 2001 named Bill Rausch. He was a couple years older than her and even when she moved from New York back to Massachusetts, they continued their relationship long distance. In November of 2003, only a few months before she went missing, Moore got in trouble again. This time, it was for stealing someone's credit card information and getting food from various restaurants delivered to her dorm room. It was said that she got this credit card information from a receipt that she had found in the garbage can in a restroom. Now in 2003, I was literally seven years old, so I'm really not sure if credit card receipts actually had the full credit card number printed on them or not, but that is the story that Maura gave, that she found it in a garbage can. Now I am going to put a little trigger warning here. I'm going to be briefly speaking on an eating disorder, I'm not gonna go into any graphic detail or anything like that, but I will put a timestamp if you're uncomfortable hearing about this little detail. So when Maura ordered this food, she ordered it in bulk. She wouldn't order just one pizza, one sub, one salad. She was ordering like two subs and a pizza and a salad. So it really raises the question, why was one person ordering so much food? It didn't seem as if she was ordering for anyone else and none of her friends or anybody came forward saying that they helped her eat all of it. So this brought into question whether or not Mora was bulimic. So we don't 100% know if Mora was bulimic or not. 
Her roommate at UMass did say that it was a pretty well-known fact that Mora was, and she even went on to say that her family would even make sly comments about it. Stuff along the lines of, why are you even gonna eat that if you're just gonna throw it up later? So if this rumor is true, then that would make sense as to why she was ordering so much food. The theory is that she would binge and purge, and like I said, this is just a rumor, but ins and outs of bulimia are quite obscure and very few people beyond medical professionals actually understand what it can do to a human body. It can definitely alter the mind and the emotional state of the person, not only the body. But this cannot be corroborated by anyone in her family. I just think that if it is true, it can possibly be a reason why her actions were so uncharacteristic of the kind of person she actually was. So just take this with a grain of salt. She didn't necessarily get in trouble for stealing this credit card information. They just kind of told her that she needed to be on her best behavior for like three months or else the charges would not be dismissed. They took a picture of her in front of her dorm and honestly, this picture has been ripped apart and dissected like crazy. People are saying she looks evil or possessed. I'll put the picture here. While I agree that this does not look like the other pictures you see of her, and yes, it kind of does look a little bit creepy, I really just think that in the pictures you see of her, she's smiling and it's different because her smile really does light up her entire face. Like she smiles with her entire face. So in this picture, when she's not smiling because it's almost like a mugshot style photo, I really don't think that her face would have looked bright and cheery because the situation was not bright and cheery. So let's get into the days leading up to Mora's disappearance. I'm just gonna say that if I do look down at my notes, I want to get this exactly right. On the evening of February 5th, 2004, Mora was working a shift at the security desk of a dorm room that wasn't too far from her own, Melville Hall. She seemed to be acting normal according to her coworkers until a little after 1 a.m. While still on her shift, she just, broke down crying like she was literally going through it when her supervisor arrived at her desk Mora was totally zoned out not talking not moving just completely unresponsive Mora's shift was supposed to be ending soon anyway so Karen her supervisor just told her to go ahead and go on home Mora continued to sit there without saying or doing anything and Karen can tell that she wasn't going to take the initiative to leave herself so Karen gathered up her belongings and escorted her to her dorm room around 1.20 a.m. And when asked what was wrong, Mora just blankly said, my sister, and pointed down at her cell phone. Karen had asked Mora if she needed to come up with her and just talk to her about whatever it is that she was going through. But Mora said that she was fine and that she had a roommate in case she felt the need to talk to anyone throughout the night. But this was not true. Mora did not have a roommate at that point. She just had a single room. A later investigation of Mora's cell phone records would show that around 10.30 that evening, Mora had spoken on the phone with her sister Kathleen. She also spoke with her boyfriend Bill from around 12.07 a.m. to 12.14 a.m. 2017, it was made public as to what Mora and Kathleen had talked about that evening. Kathleen had been struggling with alcohol and had gone to rehab to get some help for it. But the night she was released after her husband picked her up for whatever reason, he decided that the first stop that they needed to make was at the liquor store, which caused an argument. Kathleen states that she did relapse and that she was just super unhappy and spoke to Mora about this. So to me, this does make sense as to why Mora was so upset after getting off the phone with her sister. She was concerned about her. If my brother and I had the same phone call, I'm pretty sure I would be emotional as well. But that's just me. I am going to vaguely mention that on that night around the same time, another UMass student named Patrit Vasi, and I really hope I'm saying this right, he was discovered to have been hit by a car and the driver had seemingly just driven off. It's been speculated that the driver could have been Mora and that this was the real reason why she was so upset, but I'm not sure if I believe this, honestly. She was at her job at the time, and I mean, I guess she could have taken a break, but even with the break, I just feel as if it's highly unlikely that it would have been her. The timing just doesn't line up for me. On February 7th, Mora's father, Fred Murray, drove to Amherst and picked her up from her dorm room to take her car shopping. Apparently, her 1996 Saturn was not in the best condition, but none of her friends report knowing about any kind of car troubles or anything like that and none of them report knowing that Mora was gonna be going car shopping with her dad, even after the fact. That evening, they even had dinner with Mora's friend Katie, and Katie states that during the entire dinner, neither Fred nor Mora 
mention car shopping at all. I mean, I guess it's possible that they just didn't deem that conversation worthy, but I feel like during dinner you would discuss what you did that day, but maybe not. After leaving dinner, Fred said that he took the two girls to a liquor store. He said that he just let the two girls go inside and get what they needed, but he's also said that he remembers telling the girls to hurry up, indicating that he may have been inside. After this, Mora dropped her dad off at his motel, borrowing his brand new Toyota Corolla, and went back to campus to go to a dorm party with her friends Katie and Sarah around 10.30 p.m. Okay, I have an issue with this. Why would Fred Murray give his 21 year old daughter who he's just seen buy an abundance of alcohol the keys of his brand new car knowing that if she drives it that evening she will more than likely be intoxicated when she does instead of just dropping the girls off and picking them up if they needed to be brought anywhere else that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me but i'm not a parent and i'm not gonna tell anybody else how to be a parent so Katie, Sarah, and Mora all go to this party at the dorms. Katie and Sarah don't remember a thing about this party. They don't remember who was there. They don't remember anything about the party at all, which is weird. This kind of makes sense for Katie considering the party was at Sarah's place and that Katie may not have known any of the people there if they weren't her immediate friends, but Sarah did, but she just doesn't remember. It's somewhat confirmed that Mora left around 3 a.m., stating that she had to go bring her dad's car back to him at his motel. On her way to her father's motel, she approached a T-shaped intersection. This is pretty much like you can go left, you can go right, but you can't go straight. Well, Mora did. Mora went straight and crashed into the guardrail on Route 9, totaling her father's brand new Toyota Corolla. It was reported that it was about $10,000 worth of damage done to this vehicle. It doesn't seem as if Mora ever got into any kind of trouble regarding this accident. Police responded to the scene, but failed to do a field sobriety test. She had her dad's car towed back to his motel and she just kind of rode up front with the driver. Once at the motel, she somehow ended up in her dad's room without a key, but Fred claims he didn't even know that she was in his room until the next morning. That night, Mora called her boyfriend Billy from Fred's phone, so it's likely that her phone had died or something like that, but she calls his phone around 4.49 a.m. Billy claims that Mora was upset because of the accident and he did his best to calm her down. He told her to get some rest and that he would call her later on. The next morning, Mora was still pretty shaken up and upset about the accident, but Fred claims that he told her not to worry about it, that everything was okay, and that it would be covered by insurance. Now, I'm not sure if he was just glad that she was okay, but had I drove while drunk and told anyone's vehicle, whether that be mine, my brothers, or my parents, I would have been in an unimaginable amount of trouble so there's that i don't know if my parents were just strict or but i feel like anybody would be in trouble for that fred rented a car dropped mora off at her dorm room and headed off to connecticut later on at 11:30 that evening fred called mora to remind her to get the accident forms from the registry of motor vehicles they agreed to talk again on monday night to go over the forms and to fill out the insurance claim over the phone so here we are february 9th 2004 this will be the last day that anyone would see or have contact with Mora. So let's put together a timeline of that day. Around midnight, Mora's search history shows that she was looking up directions on MapQuest for the Berkshires, Lancaster, Vermont, and Burlington, Vermont. At 12.55 that afternoon, she made a phone call inquiring about renting a condo in Bartlett, New Hampshire. This call lasted three minutes and no rental resulted from this call. So Bartlett, New Hampshire was a familiar place for Mora. Her and her family would often go there on vacations dating back to when she was a kid. When she got off the phone with the condo association, she sent an email to her boyfriend, Billy. This was around 1 p.m. and it seems as if this email was in response to some calls that she had missed from him. The email subject was, hey, hey, and the email says, I love you more, stud. I got your messages, but honestly, I didn't feel like talking to much of anyone. I promise to call you today though. Love you, Mora. Billy does not respond to this email and he tries to continue to call her, but his calls are ignored. At 1.13 p.m., Mora called and left a voicemail to a classmate that she had borrowed a lab coat from, saying that she wanted to return it. At 1.24 p.m., Mora emails her work supervisors and her professors, saying that there had been a death in the family and that she would be out of school and work for about a week. This was a lie. There had been no death in the family. At 2.05 p.m., Mora calls 1-800-GHOST-STOW 
And this is pretty much just a phone number to call for hotel and tourist information for Stowe, Vermont. This call lasted for five minutes and it was later discovered that the line was actually down. So she would have been able to listen to pre-recorded information, but would not have been able to speak with like any kind of representatives or anything like that. At 2.18 PM, she left a voicemail for Billy promising that they would talk soon. He missed this call because he was on the phone with Maura's friend, Katie. He was probably trying to figure out what was going on with Maura and why she wasn't returning his calls up until that point. At 2.21, 2.22, and 2.24 PM, Billy tried calling Maura. All of these calls were ignored. Maura then proceeded to pack her car with personal belongings, some clothes, college textbooks, travel necessities, and birth control pills. It's speculated that she packed up most of her belongings in boxes and took pictures off of her wall. But I'm not totally convinced that she packed most of her belongings, but maybe she never fully unpacked from Christmas break. That's just one of those things that we don't know because nobody can corroborate this. But nonetheless, she had the majority of her belongings in boxes, and it seems as if she printed out an email and set it on top of the boxes. I couldn't find this exact email, but allegedly it was at least six months old and regarding a past infidelity of Billy's. Why she did this, we don't know. I think it's necessary to mention here that Mora had also had an affair during her relationship with Billy. Mora and the assistant track coach at UMass were said to have been having an affair during the spring and summer of 2003, but Mora broke it off during the fall to refocus on her relationship with Billy. At around 3.30 p.m., she drove off campus in her 1996 Saturn that was apparently in such awful condition, but she decided to drive it anyway. At 3.40 p.m., Mora withdrew $280 from an ATM. She left around $16 in this account, considering the ATM only allowed her to take increments of 20. There is footage of this and it showed her to be alone. She doesn't look like she's stressed or panicked. Mora then drove to a liquor store and purchased about $40 worth of alcohol. The receipt shows that she purchased Bailey's, Kahlua, vodka, and a box of Franzia wine. The security footage again showed Mora alone. At some point that day, she had also picked up the accident forms at the Registry of Motor Vehicles in Amherst. Mora left Amherst between 4 and 5 p.m., seemingly headed north on Interstate 91 North toward Vermont. The investigation revealed that there is no evidence that she told anyone where she was going that day. At 4.37 p.m., she called the dorms to check her voicemails. This would be the last time Mora would use her cell phone to make a phone call. At around 5 p.m., her cell phone pinged a tower within 20 miles of Londonderry, New Hampshire. This could mean somebody placed a call to her at this time. At around 7.25 p.m., a Woodsville, New Hampshire resident heard a loud thump outside her home. She looked out her window to find a car that would later go on to be confirmed as Mora's up against the snowbank along Route 112. The car had been spun around and was facing west on the eastbound side of the road. She called the Grafton County Sheriff's Department at 7.27 p.m. to report the accident. According to the 911 call, the woman claimed to have seen a man inside the car smoking a cigarette. She would later go on to recant this and say that she had not seen a man or a person smoking a cigarette at all, but rather had seen what could have been a red light glowing from inside the car, possibly a cell phone. At the same time, another neighbor saw the car as well as somebody walking around the car and a flurry of activity toward the trunk. She witnessed a third neighbor pull up alongside the vehicle. That neighbor was Butch Atwood. He was a school bus driver and he was returning home from work. He noticed that Mora was not bleeding or injured, but seemed to be cold and intoxicated. He offered to call for help. She declined this and stated that she had already called AAA. AAA has no record of this call and Butch knew that there was no cell phone reception in the area. So he continued on home and called the police. His call was made at 7.40 p.m. but was unable to get through. 7.43 p.m., a dispatcher calls back and speaks to Miss Atwood, who states that she has no idea where the female is, while Butch is allegedly in his bus filling out paperwork. Another local resident, originally known as Witness A, but later named as Karen McNamara, was driving home from work and claimed she passed by the scene around 7.37 p.m and saw a police SUV marked 001 parked face to face with Morris' car. She pulled over briefly and did not see anyone inside or outside the cars and decided to continue home. Karen's claims contradict the official police log that say that there was neither an SUV or a vehicle marked 001 on the scene. This report stated that Haverhill police arrived nine minutes later. There's only one police SUV in this department 
and the person who would normally drive 001 was the police chief, Jeff Williams. Nobody else saw this vehicle and Chief Jeff Williams was not recorded to be at the crash site that evening, nor was his SUV. It's been said that Jeff Williams has previously been stopped for a DWI. Armchair detectives have gone on to speculate that maybe Williams had a role in Mora's crash or came across the crash and had a hand in some kind of foul play. In Officer Cecil Smith's first ever interview, he claimed that due to the weather, he was actually the one in the SUV that evening, not Jeff Williams. So this debunks that theory. According to the official police log, at 7.46 p.m., a Haverhill police officer named Cecil Smith arrived at the scene. No one was in or around the car. The car had seemingly hit a tree on the driver's side of the vehicle, severely damaging the left headlight and had pushed the car's radiator into the fan, meaning the car wouldn't have been able to run at this moment. The car's windshield was cracked on the driver's side and both airbags had deployed. The car was locked. Inside and outside the car, he discovered red stains that looked to be red wine. Inside the car, the officer found a damaged box of Franzia wine on the rear seat. He also found a Diet Coke bottle that had a small amount of red liquid in it, assuming to be wine. A AAA card issued to Mora, blank accident report forms, gloves, CDs, makeup, jewelry, printed directions to Burlington, Vermont, some college textbooks, her birth control pill pack with three missing, some over-the-counter medication like Tylenol PM, her favorite stuffed animal, a bag of clothes and not without peril, a book about mountain climbing in the White Mountains. In this book, these climbers were either hurt or never returned. Mora's debit card, credit cards, keys, and cell phone were all missing and none of them have been located or used since her disappearance. The police later reported that some of the bottles of purchased alcohol were also missing. The responding officer and the bus driver drove around the area kind of looking for Mora for a little bit. Just before 8 p.m., EMS and a fire truck arrived to clear the scene. By 8.49 p.m., the car had been towed to a local garage. At about 9.30 p.m., the responding officer left. A rag believed to have been part of Mora's emergency roadside kit was discovered stuffed in the car's tailpipe. This could cause the car to stall. It's been speculated that maybe while Mora was stopped somewhere, somebody put the rag in her tailpipe, followed her, knowing that this would cause her car to stall and proceeded to attack or abduct her while she was tending to it. Mora's father would later go on to say that he told her to put it there to avoid getting pulled over considering she was driving a vehicle that was unsafe to drive. The test would later show that when putting a rag in a tailpipe and driving, the exhaust would shoot it out pretty immediately. So it's unlikely that Mora drove with the rag in the tailpipe at all, but rather put it in after the accident. At approximately 8.30 p.m. that evening, a contractor returning home saw a young person on foot traveling eastbound on Route 112, about four or five miles east of where Mora's car had been discovered. The day following Mora's disappearance, a be on the lookout or a bolo was issued for her. A voicemail was left for Fred Murray informing him that his daughter was missing and that her car had been found abandoned. When he called the Haverhill Police Department, he was told that if Mora was not found by the following morning, the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department would initiate a search. With snow on the ground, the average temperature in Haverhill is 38 degrees during the day, dropping to 18 degrees at night. At 5 p.m., Mora's boyfriend and his parents arrived in Haverhill. He was interrogated in private and then joined by his parents for questioning. At 7 p.m., the police said they believe Mora came to this area to either run away or commit suicide. Her family said that this was very unlikely. Billy had turned off his cell phone during his flight to Haverhill. At some point, he received a voicemail that he believed was the sound of Mora sobbing. The call was traced to a calling card issued to the American Red Cross. Mora was currently on Billy's phone plan, but had been known to use calling cards prior to this. The FBI joined the search within 10 days of Mora's disappearance, and Haverhill announced that the search had gone nationwide. Meanwhile, Mora's father and her boyfriend, Billy, interviewed on CNN's American Morning, pleading with someone to come forward. Mora's family extended their search into Vermont, and they were pretty shocked when they found out that authorities there had not been informed of her disappearance. I mean, that's where it seems like she was headed. So why weren't they informed of her disappearance? New Hampshire Fish and Game had conducted a ground search in the days following, but 10 days after Moore's disappearance, they conducted a ground and air search, utilizing helicopter with a thermal imaging camera cadaver dogs, and tracking dogs. Morris scent was picked up approximately 100 yards from where her vehicle had been found, 
but suddenly stopped, indicating to police that she possibly got into a passing vehicle. I think it's something to note that the item that they gave the dogs to get her scent off of was a glove that she'd only had for a couple months. Had worn it a lot. I'm not sure if the dogs would have been able to get a good scent off of it like they would have been had they been given like her running gear or a coat that she wore every day or something like that. Fred Murray returned to Haverhill nearly every weekend to search for Mora until police informed him that they were getting complaints about him trespassing on private property. In late 2004, a man named Larry Mooton supposedly gave Mora's father a rusty stained knife that apparently belonged to his brother Claude. Claude had a criminal record and lived less than a mile from where the car was discovered. Claude and his girlfriend Skye were acting super strange after the disappearance and Larry claimed he believed the knife had been used to kill Mora. Several days after the knife had been given to Fred, Larry allegedly scrapped his Volvo. Larry's family members claimed he made up the story to receive reward money in the investigation and that he had a history of drug use, so don't really think he's credible whatsoever. In 2005, Fred Murray petitioned New Hampshire Governor Craig Benson for help in the search and appeared on the Montel Williams show in November 2004 to publicize the case. On February 9, 2005, the one-year anniversary of Moore's disappearance, a service was held where the car was found. Fred felt like the police were not pursuing Moore's case properly or sharing enough information with him. So in 2006, he sued the state of New Hampshire. His lawsuit went all the way to the New Hampshire Supreme Court and the state won. Fred felt like the police didn't want to pursue the case because of its close proximity to a tourist destination. Many people have said that it feels as if New Hampshire law enforcement has spent over a decade concealing the findings of this investigation. Fred thinks that the silence is covering up something even more sinister than what they can imagine. Jeff Strelzen, New Hampshire's Assistant Attorney General, states that their silence is due to the fact that this is still an open investigation and they don't want any sensitive information to be leaked to the public. If someone was responsible for her disappearance, they don't want them to know what evidence authorities have or don't have. In October of 2006, volunteers led a two-day search within a few miles of where Mora's car was found. In the closet of an A-frame house approximately one mile from the crash site, cadaver dogs allegedly went bonkers, possibly identifying the presence of human remains. The house had formerly been the residence of Claude Mooton. A sample of carpet from the home was sent to the New Hampshire State Police, but the results were never released to the public. In early 2012, web sleuths began taking note of a YouTube user named Mr. 112 Dirtbag, who posted a series of videos that were just odd. They were weird, man. One of them was posted on the anniversary of Moore's disappearance. And this guy was just manically laughing and then just stopped and smiled and the words happy anniversary flashed across the screen. Both the family and professional criminologists dismissed the videos as just a cruel and hideous way to get attention. In 2014, on the 10th anniversary of Mora's disappearance, it was stated that we haven't had any credible sightings of Mora since the night she disappeared. In an article published in the New York Daily News on the 10th anniversary of his daughter's disappearance, it was reported that Fred Murray believed that she was dead and had been abducted the night of her disappearance. In February 2019, on the 15th anniversary of Mora's disappearance, Fred Murray reiterated his belief that his daughter is dead, as well as his suspicions about the nearby house that the cadaver dogs responded to, stating, that's my daughter, I do believe. In early April of 2019, excavation was done within the basement of the house. Fred Murray had previously wanted to search the home, but the owners did not cooperate. Following the sale of the property, its new owners have allowed several searches of the property since last February. The excavation conducted in early April of last year found absolutely nothing other than what appears to be a piece of pottery or old piping. Mora's disappearance has been cited the first crime mystery of the social media age. Facebook was only five days old and Twitter and YouTube didn't even exist yet. Social media is now one of the main sources of communication and there is an entire community that has spent their time trying to find out what happened to Mora. While there is little evidence that suggests what exactly happened to Mora, Amateur sleuths seem to hone in on four different possibilities. These possibilities are including, but not limited to, some think that she went missing on her own and started a new life somewhere. Some think that maybe she died of exposure and just hasn't been found yet. Some say that she committed suicide in the woods. 
And some also say that maybe she was killed by someone who preyed upon her when she was at her most vulnerable. The most popular theory is that Mora was picked up by someone with cruel intentions. Possibly a local, maybe someone that she knew, or someone just passing through town. Some of these theories are based on the fact that dogs lost her scent in the middle of the road not too far from her crashed vehicle. Is it possible that Mora was just under a lot of stress from the first car accident, possible relationship issues, school, and the possible criminal charges from using the credit card that she just wanted to get away for a while? Maybe had a plan to be gone a week and it all went awry? Maybe she freaked out when she crashed another car, possibly while drunk again, and decided to hide out? Possibly wandered too far or had a concussion from the accident and became dazed and got lost? succumbed to the elements and her remains were then scattered by animals. We already know that Mora didn't want Butch Atwood to call for help, possibly because she knew that this time she was likely to get in trouble for causing yet another car accident. Flight is a human defense mechanism after all, and she was an avid runner, so I could see her frantically taking off because she's scared of the consequences. The only thing that makes me think that this is not what happened is because the dogs didn't find her scent anywhere in the woods and there were no footprints in the snow or evidence of her being in the woods at all. As far as suicide goes, there's really no evidence that she was suicidal at all, and there's no evidence that she had the resources to do so. Had she taken her own life, it's more likely that police or investigators would have found her by now. I also think it's really unlikely that she ran away to start a new life. It was later found out that she had actually done homework the day before her disappearance, and if she was planning on running away and completely starting over, I don't see why she would have taken the time to do her homework considering she knew that she wouldn't return. I also feel like she would have brought more of her belongings and it would be extremely difficult to completely start your whole life over with only 280 bucks. Well, technically 240 considering she spent $40 on alcohol. Also, Lori Murray passed away on Moore's birthday in 2009. I feel as if Mora had just ran away, she would have come back to go to her mother's funeral. Her death was made public and so Mora would have known about it. Her and her mother were extremely close and I don't think that she would have found staying hidden more important than being there to say her final goodbyes to her mother. So as far as suspects go, a lot of people found Butch Atwood to be suspicious. His story was never fully consistent. He changes little things regarding his story and his interaction with Mora. Butch has since passed away and I honestly don't believe that he had any involvement with the disappearance of Mora. I mean, Butch was an older, obese man with no criminal record and I think it's a stretch to claim that in the spur of the moment, he decides to abduct a fit, army trained young woman in full view of his neighbors and walking distance of his home where he lives with his wife and her mother, and then proceed to go inside his home, tell his wife about this young woman, and then call the cops who arrived moments later. I just feel like that is a really big stretch. Another thing that has been accused by people on the internet is that her dad somehow had something to do with it, but I'm gonna be honest, I don't see that at all. So I'm not gonna speak on that theory any further, honestly. Someone else who has been on everyone's mind regarding Mora's disappearance is, of course, her boyfriend. Yes, Billy was cooperative and it seems as if he had nothing to hide, but it wasn't what happened before Mora's disappearance that raised eyebrows, but what happened after. A woman who met Billy in the following months after Mora's disappearance has come forward saying that one day her and Bill were at a stoplight and he reached over and grabbed her throat and said, I'll kill you like I killed Mora. This woman, being the total queen that she is, reached over, dug her nails in him and said, I'll rip off your crotch. Yeah, girl. Of course, immediately Bill's demeanor changed and he said he was just joking, but I really don't think that that's something to joke about, especially only a few months after your girlfriend's disappearance, but okay. In 2011, Billy lost his job at Ray Group International after being accused of sexual assault by a coworker. There are timestamp text messages that can support this allegation. So, 
but I think people tend to forget that he was out of state on a military base when Moritz disappeared and he flew in with his parents. So while I can't comment on his 2011 allegations, I don't think he had anything to do with Mora's disappearance. I've also seen a lot of speculation at the very last witness to see Mora that evening. The contractor who was heading home and spotted a young person on foot. His name was Rick Forcier. I think I'm saying that right. What's odd about Rick is that he did not come forward until three months later, but claims that that was due to him getting his days mixed up. He lived about 100 yards from the accident scene and had multiple stories about what happened that night. Over the years, he's made crude comments about Mora, insinuating that she came over to his house and wanted to sleep with him and stuff like that. So that's kind of weird. He also declined authorities when they asked to search his trailer. So that's weird too. All these sketchy people in her life, like I am mad. So what really happened to Mora Murray? It's been over 16 years and I feel like we're not any closer to finding out what really happened. Her family hasn't given up, although they do believe that she's no longer alive. Even finding her remains would give them some kind of closure. I do agree with this notion. I don't believe that she's just out living a brand new life somewhere with a new identity. I think she meant to go away for a week or so just to kind of clear her head and take some time to herself. She either died in the woods due to the elements or was a victim to someone with sinister intentions. Maura Murray was said to be a funny and overall sweet girl. Yes, she made some mistakes, we all have, but she still deserves some kind of justice. So that is it for me today, guys. I hope I was able to give you some kind of insight on this roller coaster of a case. I'm going to be leaving some phone numbers down in the description box. If you have any kind of information about Maura's disappearance, or anything like that, even if it's the tiniest of details, please call, I'm urging you. you. What you think may be unimportant may be so important to authorities and the family. So stay weird, stay safe, stay home, and please, for the love of God, wash your hands. We're gonna get through this quarantine thing, just gotta wait it out, but please just do all those things. All right, so I will see you in my next one. Bye, guys.